Thank you everybody for joining us today. Uh, and thanks for joining the first of 10 of our Tales from the Trenches live webinars. I'm dedicating this series to the most vulnerable out there, our courageous healthcare workers who are on the front lines for all of us. I believe really strongly that all of us who are not directly involved in healing people who are sick must really double down now to save jobs, keep our economy stable and strong, and, and, and in my case, uh, to keep healthy, organic, nourishing food flowing out there. Uh, I'm gonna spend just a couple of minutes right now introducing the entire series, and then I'm gonna share about 20 minutes of my own story um, about confronting and overcoming challenges, and then um, offering a few suggestions for how we can all cope with the crisis at hand. And then today's moderator, Ethan Hirschberg, the founder of uh, Ethan's um, Organic Beverages, uh, will come on uh, and bring some of his questions, and then we will discuss uh, them. And, and finally, he'll present your questions as well. And as Julie explained, you can submit questions to this and our future speakers uh, using the uh, Q&A function. So this series is about meeting and overcoming challenges. Each of our 10 speakers have been confronted with severe challenges that caused us to find new solutions, both in actions, but also in choices. And but mainly inside ourselves. Um, you will hear throughout my conversation this morning, but I think through the other nine speakers who will come to you that uh, they really, when you're an entrepreneur, there really is no difference between our personal lives and our business lives and the changes we need to make in our businesses really start from within. Um, in any case, I'm grateful to all of my fellow speakers for joining us. Uh, and this series is also brought to you by the uh, Hirschberg uh, Entrepreneurship Institute. May 6th and 7th, H and A, uh, 7th and 8th, excuse me. Uh, uh, HEI has always been about helping mission-driven companies and brands by sharing their experiences with uh, hard-earned um, wisdom of generous leaders like the folks who are doing this series to help us all be better entrepreneurs in whatever way that you define it, nonprofit, for-profit, your own family life, however you, just, you define yourself as an entrepreneur. And it's a chance, frankly, to offer something that I wish I had had during our building years. So at times like this, I'm really, really grateful to all of our speakers and leaders for if there was ever a time to come together and help lift us all up, this is really it. Uh, as I mentioned, our two-day boot camp will take place on May 7th and 8th, and we're able to offer it actually at $75, uh, thanks to the generous support of our sponsors. Normally, it would be a $500 couple of days. But the Genuzzi Group, Bank of America, uh, New Hope Network, and Whipstitch Capital have uh, put this together, and I'm very grateful to them. So turning to my story, uh, you know, many people now see Stonyfield as this large company, which, of course, it is. We have nearly $400 million of sales. We have uh, 400 employees. We support thousands of family farmers, and we actually support hundreds of thousands of acres of chemical-free farmland. Uh, but if you've listened to my interview on NPR's How I Built This, uh, you will know that at no time in our early days, and I would say our first 10 years, were, was our survival, let alone our success, ever guaranteed. And although we refer to our very prolonged nine-year startup uh, till break-even as the bad old days, um, there were actually two major personal crisis periods for us and for me. So, uh, Carlene, if you can go ahead and screen share my slides and I'll walk you through them. Um, let me first set a little bit of background. So this first picture is Stonyfield Farm. It's a hilltop farm in New Hampshire. Uh, still, the farm still is there. Um, we often joke that we had 11 months of winter, one month of poor sledding. A beautiful, scenic place, but not a great place to start a business. Uh, next slide shows the actual farmhouse. Um, our moderator, Ethan, was literally born in this farmhouse, as was his brother, his older brother, Alex. Um, and again, uh, we lived here, our office was here, our cows were here, the yogurt works was here, and my partner, uh, partners, the Cayman family, who uh, go to the next slide. You can see here Samuel and Louise on the left, and uh, my child bride Meg, way back when. Uh, we all lived together in one uh, very tight little incestuous uh, place. Um, again, beautiful place to raise children, terrible, terrible place to start a business. Uh, if you go to the next slide, you'll understand what I'm saying. Uh, this was our yogurt making uh, room, a terribly cramped place. Um, you can see here uh, no automation in the early going. We technically you're supposed to have an automated litter 
that would actually put the lid on top of the yogurt cups. Uh, we had one, it never worked. So when the FDA inspector would come up, we'd just say, you can't, I can't believe it. It's a, um, you, you have this amazing knack for showing up on the days when it isn't working. But eventually, next slide, please. We actually did get some automation into this incredibly cramped space, as you see here. It was uh, probably uh, 12 feet by about uh, 20 feet in there. And, you know, people always bumping into each other. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, lots of bumps and bruises and cuts, and obviously sanitation was super challenged, but we did manage to make Samuel's absolutely extraordinary yogurt. This whole enterprise was an absolute testament to Samuel, Samuel's genius, uh, his wife and daughter's uh, tenaciousness in uh, being our primary yogurt makers. Um, but uh, in 1987, so we started in 1983 with sales of roughly uh, $2 million. We actually exceeded the capacity of this little funky hilltop farmhouse. So we moved to a factory that was in Western Massachusetts, about two hours away. They had, unlike us, real loading docks, real floor drains, city water, reliable electricity, a paved road, and they actually had space to grow. And we were in that place for about four months when one Friday night, which happened to be coincidentally the weekend of the crash of 87, for those who remember that era, uh, one Friday night we learned that uh, the Small Business Administration was no longer going to renew the loan guarantee for this little dairy after three consecutive years of them missing their own covenants. And, you know, unfortunately in our eagerness to move and deal with the challenges of the moment of outgrowing our facility, we had not done any real due diligence and instead we had just trusted a relationship with the owner there. They were immediately put into chapter seven. and We were suddenly without a factory. So by then we had grown to about, by about 50% to $3 million. And we'd already been bursting at the seams when we moved out of that little funky hilltop. But now uh, we had no choice but to restart back up in the original cramp facility. Um, I borrowed about $100,000 on that first day from some investors. Uh, to buy back our inventory, we had to pay the bank to get our cups and our yogurt and our fruit and our our, our milk out of there. And then we also uh, to get to get our packaging released. And then we put on our carpenter belts and went back uh, to our little funky place and spent four days frantically cleaning and restarting this little uh, factory. Um, we began at that moment working around the clock, seven days a week, just to try to stay in stock with our customers. As you. No, as a perishable product, we had there was no provision for running out of stock. If we lost our space, they would fill it with something else. So with all the inefficiency of trying to jam way too much product through a truly inadequate infrastructure, we began suffering huge, huge losses. Uh, let's go to the next slide, and you can see, um, you know, as an example, we had no warehouse space at that little farm when we had left. So here is our forklift uh, lifting a pallet off of our dock. We Samuel got this brilliant idea that we could take the old carriage house across the driveway um, and we uh, could put in a concrete floor. He and I and our team built that floor over that weekend, put, a, put in, uh, shored it up underneath with post and beam and um, literally built ourselves a warehouse. Go to the next slide and you can see it across the driveway, which meant that we had to forklift product out of our funky little yogurt making across a muddy dirt way, uh, driveway, which was either filled with snow, ice, or mud most of the year. And they'd sometimes be people almost like curlers shoveling in front, frantically in front as the forklift made its way across the driveway, shaking the yogurt. And uh, it was just a nightmare, lots of spillage and drops and so forth. Um, and then uh, you can uh, see here, uh, that the other problem was at the top of, on the next slide, at the top of our hilltop, um, we had this seven tenths of a mile dirt road with a 90 degree hairpin turn at the top. So trucks were always getting started here. This I believe was a, this tractor trailer you see here was the last time uh, our cup and lid manufacturer actually delivered to the farm. After this for the next two years while we were struggled on this farm, they insisted that we would drive down the hill um, to town to pick up our cups and our lids, which meant of course, double, triple handling, uh, shifting stuff in winter and ice storms, moving pallets of their product across to our little truck and then making our way back up the hill. The next slide, of course, also shows you uh, what would happen with the milk truck. Um, this was a, uh, a classic uh, day for us, uh, very typical. Uh, 
milk truck would always get bogged down. If we didn't have snow or ice, we had mud, like I said, and uh, the next slide will show you, of course, the inevitable result, usually despite trying to dig and uh, take uh, stuff, uh, get the trucks out, we always wound up with a wrecker. So you can see all the money that was being spent hemorrhaging uh, to actually keep this little business alive. But just to sort of bring out the color a little bit further, uh, we, uh, Wednesday nights, I always had to meet a payroll. Uh, the next day by noon, I would have to come up with 35 to 4,000, 3,500 or 4,000. And often our bedroom was about 50 feet from my office. Often I would tiptoe from the bedroom over to the office thinking Meg was asleep to call my, my incredible saintly mother-in-law and ask if I could borrow another thousand bucks. And much more often than not, uh, as you'll read in Meg uh, Hirschberg's uh, book about this era, uh, she would be calling her mom on the other phone saying, mom, don't do it. And eventually her mother and I had to agree, and Meg, that we just weren't gonna tell Meg how much money she was loaning because it was too painful for us all. Um, we did all those things that probably a lot of you are doing right now we, to, to stretch cash. Uh, we had what we called our payroll check cashing contest. Who could go the longest without cashing their paycheck? Of course, the reward was all the yogurt you could eat. Um, inevitably, to stretch payables, I would take a check in an envelope out into the, this uh, nice muddy driveway of ours and uh, step on it a few times, get dirt on it, and then I'd stick it in my drawer. And when the, when the uh, vendor called and um, said, where's my money? I would say, you wouldn't believe what happened. It fell out of the mailbag. Uh, that, that trick worked pretty well. I, I sent it to them with mud on it. That worked really well until I did it twice to the same person. So that one had to go by the by. Um, we had a shareholder who sued us during this period. And, and, and then, as Meg likes to say, somehow in the middle of all of this, we decided it was a good idea to bring children into the world. So this is Maggie uh, pregnant with uh, our very first one. And here he is. Uh, he was pretty much expressing how all of us were feeling right about now. Uh, this is Alec. He, Alex, he was born very colicky. Um, I would drive around at dirt, on dirt roads at night with him in my left hand. Uh, and uh, so Meg could sleep for an hour or two and I'd, I'd keep the windows open so I could actually stay awake. Now, um, as I'll describe in a couple minutes, I did develop lots of coping strategies that I want to share with you. Uh, but before I do that, I want to first mention one other equally tough phase that followed this one. As I mentioned earlier, there were two really tough phases. And it's important first that I uh, give you a little background here. This is my birth family, uh, my sisters and my uh, twin brothers back in 1964 in Manchester, New Hampshire. And um, here are my brothers. Uh, on my right in the, in the picture, your left is Billy, uh, who was one of our sales guys, uh, worked for the company. And this is Jim uh, on my right. Um, Around the time we finally got through the really dark period uh, and, and began to actually make money, which was 1991, I, I mentioned to you it was nine years till we broke even. Um, we finally exited off the farm and got ourselves a home uh, in Concord, New Hampshire. And uh, Billy on uh, my right there was in our living room one day and he had a ventricular tracheocardia, which for those who don't know what that means, means his heart stopped. He had a sudden death event. And literally, if we had been living up in Wilton at the farm, uh, he would have died. But uh, the, uh, we had EMTs who got there in less than two minutes and restarted his heart with paddles. And, and um, this uh, was the beginning of a discovery that both of my brothers actually had a degenerative heart disease. And thus began a very long uh, decade of endless hospital stays, surgeries, defibrillators, and ultimately their decline. Now, by 1999, uh, seven years after this VT event of Billy's, um, we had righted our ship at Stonyfield. We had grown uh, in a new location to about 75 million in sales, and it came time to find an exit for the 200, now 297 shareholders who had gotten us through this crisis. And so we began then a very prolonged and scary uh, negotiation process that ultimately took two years before I sold the company to Danone. Uh, there were lots of people in suits uh, visiting us, lots of lawyers, lots of accountants. We were, it was a terrifying time, hundreds of pages of detailed documents. 
Uh, and in the middle of these negotiations, uh, both of my brothers sadly passed. Uh, they were twins and they died um, two months apart on either side, uh, one month on either side of their 40th birthday. Uh, so here we are trying to save the company, uh, do this sale, and uh, of course we've had this just uh, incredible loss, and our, our, which was horrible enough, but our mourning was then interrupted by the discovery that Meg actually had advanced breast cancer, which required surgery, uh, chemo, uh, and radiation. And of course, all this while I'm negotiating the fate of this business, and if you're keeping track, you'll also know that 9-11 happened right about now, which of course was a nightmare for us all. So um, let me uh, pause the video here uh, for a moment. And um, uh, let me say that uh, what I'd like to now pivot to is um, what got me through both periods. Um, and um, this, um, uh, what I wanna talk to you about, because I think it's very relevant to what everybody's going through right now, uh, and I should just confirm, uh, Ethan, will you give me a thumbs up? Can you all see me right now? Okay, good. Um, so I want to share several things that happened to me. And as you've heard me go back and forth between the personal and the business and the personal, I think for the most of the 400 of you who are on right now, I think you understand what I'm saying, which is that there is really, when you're an entrepreneur, there's no line, there's no difference. And so the the five areas I want to talk to you about in terms of my own coping um, are really, uh, they range from business tactics to deeply personal uh, commitments and transformations, and they're all absolutely interrelated. Um, the first of these uh, tactics, I'll call it, is the ability to comp compartmentalize. Um, this is something uh, that uh, is probably very near and dear and real to any of you watching today. Um, there is a need to literally control the inflow right now. Uh, Meg and I currently have a little pact, which is at 6 p.m. at night. After 6 p.m., we are not going to watch CNN. We're not going to talk about that orange guy in the White House. Uh, we are not going to discuss coronavirus. Um, we, are, uh, we have learned we, you have to draw the line. And um, this, how you do it, uh, how you get control of that inflow, how you compartmentalize is something that I'm going to tell you, you can learn. Uh, I wanna draw your attention to two really cool uh, resources that are available right now. For those of you who uh, don't know the Sam Harris uh, Making Sense podcast, um, I urge you to, Check it out. And on our, uh, at the Hirschberg Institute uh, site, uh, there's a link to uh, his March 20th uh, podcast, which is on uh, meditation in an emergency. Uh, Sam is a mindfulness uh, scholar, uh, and he offers in this 20 minute um, podcast a, a very uh, simple and clear and coherent. Uh, Converse discussion about the importance of understanding one's own mind in an emergency and Sam makes the case and then you can follow from that 20 minute intro to his um, very um, Encyclopedic uh, set of resources about mindfulness training meditation and so forth, but he makes the case that anyone can learn to do this um, I also want to draw your attention to uh, Meg uh, she uh, has a, a, a program that uh, she has started that she chairs called the anti-cancer lifestyle program and uh in the anti-cancer lifestyle program there's an absolutely exquisite mindset module and again the link to that uh module is on our website it's a course you can take it it's um absolutely something that anybody can follow through uh the key is you've got to find calm in the storm which is exactly the name of maggie's uh, mindset module now I want to be the first to tell you I'm a horrible meditator. Uh, I may talk about these guys, but I, I've got too much of a monkey mind. Uh, I, I've tried and it doesn't work, but I did learn to compartmentalize through this period that I've, these two periods, um, by finding what worked for me. And what works for me is jigsaw puzzles. 
Um, Ethan will tell you uh, that I sat sit through crises constantly uh, with a big giant puzzle and I'll just uh, maybe have a you know half an inch of scotch or whatever is appropriate at that moment and Ethan's shot and I'll just disappear into them and for me it's a complete meditation it's my way of shutting off the world. Uh, Crossword puzzles have been working for me this last week and if uh, on the New York Times you can get the mini you can get the MIDI and you can get the max. Um, but whatever it is to find your calm in the storm, I will tell you that somehow these crises taught me that. Uh, I was able uh, time and again to just keep it together. When venture capitalists would, uh, one guy sat with his feet up on his desk, clipping his fingernails during our meeting. Uh, I just you know, didn't let those guys penetrate. And you need to do the same. You have to create your buffers. Now, you may think that I'm uh, seeming very self-centered in, 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 in recommending to you that you focus first on yourself and your own ability to compartmentalize, compartmentalize. but I'm going to just be very direct here. Whatever business tactics you've got, whatever responsibilities you've got, whoever is you are responsible for, you are no good to them if you're not first taking care of yourself, which leads me to my second area that I want to briefly share with you, which is my ability to compartmentalize, whether again, it's through meditation, which I'm terrible at, or puzzles, or walks. Uh, mine is directly uh, related to how I take care of myself. And the first point is sleep. Um, I am a really good sleeper. Uh, my assistant, Sue, at Stonyfield, uh, was always blown away by the fact that I could close the curtains in my office, lie down uh, for six minutes on my couch before an intense meeting, and I'd tell her, if I'm not awake in five minutes, five and a half minutes, uh, wake me up, but I would always wake up. I could fall asleep sitting here with you right now if you want, and hopefully some of you, are, are none of you will be able to do that. But, but the point is, uh, good, uh, whatever your number is, six, seven, eight hours, you need it. And now is a really important time. And there's all kinds of clinical evidence. And again, you can go to the Anti-Cancer Lifestyle Program and, and, and see in this 360-degree wellness approach that sleep is absolutely a critical, critical contributor to your overall health, wellness, and, 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 and your immune system. Uh, for me, exercise is as critical as sleep. Um, during the really dark days that I just described, especially when we would come back you know, after a long day of making yogurt and raising money and negotiating, and then we'd go to the hospital to see one or both brothers uh, or go to a radiation treatment for Maggie, I would often, and, and even in the early days of Stonyfield, I would go to our tennis club at 10 p.m. at night. It was mainly because it was free then. We didn't have any money. Uh, and I had another entrepreneur friend, and, I, and we, he and I would play tennis at 10 at night. And I'd be whacking this poor little yellow fuzzy balls with literally tears flowing down my face. This was how I unloaded the, the tension, the stress. But, and, and Meg, in the very earliest going, wondered you know, what was going on here. I'd, I'd have my 14, 15 hour days, and then during an hour when I could be with her, I'd instead be off playing tennis. And, but I, I knew I, I would be a horrible partner, mate, husband at home if I hadn't been doing this. And I would come home you know, having spent all that sweat and and showered and, and, and I could then be with her and be present and be mindful. And of course, eating is the third leg, right? I mean, sleep, exercise, critical. I, right now, I, I don't know uh, uh, how I would do this if I weren't uh, cycling uh, two hours a day, just getting out and, uh, and if you can't be outside, you know, get on that exercise cycle, but you've got to do something. And of course, eating, and I might uh, underscore here, eating well. Uh, I know um, yesterday on, um, on Pod Save America, the guys were talking about one of the downsides of all this uh, home isolation is too much snacking. And I, everybody I've been talking to is, is eating a lot. So the key is you got to eat well. Um, you gotta, uh, I recommend uh, this little uh, dude here, the Ethan's uh, Fire Shots. Uh, but uh, whatever it is, you're organ I'm, I'm eating a ton of organic fruit right now. Uh, apples, oranges, uh, making applesauce, uh, but whatever it is, you've got to feed the body. Um, now, sleep, of course, is dependent on not running out of cash <laughs> to get back to the business aspects of this. Um, and um, I will uh, 
reshare here uh, to uh, bring something up uh, on our um, on our uh, site. Sorry, I'm a little off thumbs here. Um, sorry. Uh, uh, on our site, you will see I have. Sorry, there, folks. I have this um, cash flow tool that we have posted and that you can download. And tomorrow, oops, sorry. Um, tomorrow I will be um, doing a webinar which we'll talk about before we end here. Sorry, folks, I'm just a little dorky with this thing. Um, this uh, is a cash flow tool that you can download and, um, and it's an Excel spreadsheet. And this is something that uh, I use. I uh, frankly uh, developed it very organically. Uh, back in the early days of Stonyfield, in the, the darkness as I described it, we um, were not concerned with uh, annual cash flow or monthly cash flow or weekly cash flow. I was concerned with daily cash flow. I knew how much had to come in the next day because I knew how much was going out. And um, it's not my purpose on today's webinar to walk you through this tool. We are doing one tomorrow. Andy Whitman and I will walk you through it. But download it. You will see for yourselves. It's very, very easy to use. But I developed this uh, literally where you see across the top of the spreadsheet uh, weeks. Uh, you can change that to days. And uh, with this tool, uh, and, and by the way, with uh, 100 companies since then, I've used this, you will find it is a simple, simple device that allows you to see what's coming. Obviously, the key with cash flow is if you uh, are out of it, it's too late. The whole key is forecasting, right, is looking ahead. And uh, the only way I could go to sleep at night would be to finish that day's entry into this journal. Um, takes five minutes, I would plug in what had come in that day, what had gone out, and, and I would go to sleep knowing that the next day I had to come up with X thousands of dollars. Um, managing your cash right now is probably the most crucial thing you can possibly do. Um, this means, uh, frankly, um, don't be promoting if you're in the consumer products uh, space. Uh, uh, harvest, your, uh, save your dollars. Uh, it means narrow down your number of SKUs. It means uh, collect, collect, collect. It means if you have a line of credit available for you, uh, uh, take it all out. Put it into your bank account. Don't leave it sitting in the bank. You, you must, you don't, if you don't control your cash destiny, then you're not controlling your destiny. Now, I want to say a quick word here to all of the many uh, entrepreneurs listening, which is um, all of us as entrepreneurs are what I call pathological optimists. Uh, what that means is uh, this exercise is garbage in, garbage out. It's only as good as what you're putting in. And as a pathological optimist, uh, this means that you need to put in the payables part of your forecast, whatever kind of tool you're using, whether you're using mine or others, you must, must, must double the outflow that you think because surprises are going to happen. And you must, must, must uh, speed up the time when you're going to have to pay it out. And similarly, on the incoming cash flow, um, you've got to have the time, have the amount. There'll be deductions being taken and so on. My point, simply put, is um, we cash flow is critical. Managing your cash is critical. But not fooling yourself is, is absolutely essential, or the whole exercise is a fallacy. And uh, so I just can't stress enough uh, uh, that this is if you're not doing this every single day right now, uh, you got to start. Now, um, the uh, critical thing here is for most of us, um, it, again, in the consumer product world, like I said before, we need to behave differently right now than you are um, uh, normally uh, uh, operating. You need to be um, uh, not promoting, like I said before. Um, you need to be um, uh, uh, cutting back on SKUs that may not be your top selling SKUs. Uh, innovation is great and really important, uh, but it burns cash. And to support that, you need your core um, SKUs, the things that are really um, 
most central to your profits, the things that are generating the most incoming revenue. You need to focus on those. If you have 10 SKUs and four of them are carrying the weight, then go with those four. Believe me, our distributors, our warehouses, our wholesalers are all having a hard time keeping up anyways. Um, look, yes is the most dangerous word for an entrepreneur. You've got to learn to say no, and that includes to yourself. And by the way, back in those dark days of Stonyfield, when we did that, when we cut down the number of SKUs, you know, Samuel had launched uh, garden salad yogurt, right? A uh, little ahead of its time. And spicy garden salad, which was like super ahead of its time. Like there will never be a time for that product. Uh, you know, freeze dried herbs would float to the top and it looked like a putting green. I mean, it was, it was delicious, but not very appealing to the eye. We got rid of that. We pulled those things out. We, we cut down to the red, white, and blue in the case of yogurt, you know, raspberry, strawberry, vanilla, plain, and, and blueberry. And that's what got us through. Which leads me to the final uh, uh, point that I want to make, which is the other key that I learned through that entire period, and this is a big word, and I, I mean it in all senses of the word, is over-communicate. Um, we got into, in the really dark uh, moments at Stonyfield when we brought all that volume back to the farm, we did daily whole staff meetings, check-ins. Now, of course, we were 16 people. It wasn't so hard to do. Uh, my vendors, my suppliers who I couldn't pay, I had weekly phone calls with them uh, where we talked about what was coming, what I could do, what I couldn't do. And, and for the most part, uh, vendors who had lost hundreds of thousands of dollars with us in that collapse of that other dairy, they were forgiving. They understood when we were... Um, uh, when I said I couldn't send more than X, as long as I delivered on what I said. So promise only what you can deliver, but deliver on your promises. That's over-communication. Over-communicate with your shareholders and your lenders. People know these are hard times. Uh, talk to them. Uh, it might be an email newsletter. It might be a thank you note. Uh, it, uh, uh, thank yous to your employees are critical. And I might add, uh, finally, over-communicate with your loved ones. Uh, look, if you think you can carry that, uh, you know, difficulty uh, that you're feeling in the world, those fears, uh, if you think you can fool your kids, your spouse, forget it. You can't. They see it. They know it. So talk. You know, maybe um, a, a family meeting. Our family is now doing Zoom meetings uh, regularly to keep up in touch with each other. And the last piece of over-communicate and my final piece of advice before I go to our moderator is if you don't ask, you don't get. And uh, this is the adage I told you about earlier. This is obviously what I learned when I went to over 600 people uh, to raise money. I mean, our UPS guy didn't like to come up to the farm on payroll day for fear I'd hit him up for a loan, okay? I mean, whoever, I used to say anyone with a necktie was fair game. Look, uh, this is the key to surviving as an entrepreneur, believing in yourself, taking care of yourself, and people trusting that people will always say no. So um, what I'd like to do now, uh, and thank you for listening, is uh, go back uh, to, um, again, sorry for the all thumbs. Uh, well, forget it, I can't get to the slides. I'll, get, I'll, I'll find my way back. Uh, let's turn the mic to, ah, here he is. Let's turn the uh, mic to our moderator. Uh, this is Ethan. I've already mentioned uh, his uh, amazing um, fire shots. Um, his organic energy shots in this picture are extraordinary. And uh, without further ado, I give you my son, Ethan. Thank you. It's weird looking at yourself while you talk. Um, so just a quick reminder to everybody on here. Um, if you want to ask a question directly to Gary, put it in the Q&A section. Um, I've seen a lot coming through on the chat. Um, I can try to sift through, but that's, um, I, I see a couple in there. And um, Matt, we're going to kind of get right to yours. Um, I think the, the first question as an early stage entrepreneur, um, when, when we hear you, we being most of the small company founders on this chat, um, when we hear you talking about cutting innovation and promos, um, I think what we're actually hearing is sacrifice growth for stability, um, which obviously uh, makes sense. And obviously every crisis is different. Um, but is that essentially what you're saying? And, and obviously bearing in mind that we're competing, uh, we're in a really competitive landscape and, and competing for investments and um, having to hit forecasts and things like that. 
Yeah, well, you put your finger on it and I might add, you know it personally right this second. You know, for those watching, Ethan has a wonderful little business. Uh, he had a ton of innovation lined up for this spring, all kinds of uh, cash uh, uh, forecasts and investments tied to it. And they've been suspended and they've been suspended, not because of him, but because literally our wholesale customers are unable to move it through the pipeline. Uh, back in Stonyfield's case, um, when we did finally crack, Ethan and everybody, it was because of what I said before. Yes, we, 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 we sacrificed not just growth, but we, uh, we focused on efficiency. And efficiency comes from the 80-20 rule. You know, um, inevitably, if we had 30 SKUs, we were making our money on eight of them. And the others would eventually make us money, but we just hit the pause button. And it was painful, um, and uh, also sometimes we had to backtrack on promises and commitments to our customers. But uh, yeah, it was necessary. And at this moment right now, um, it is absolutely uh, essential. Uh, you, like I said before, uh, retailers can, they're not focused on promotion, they're focused on trying to keep their shelves stocked. Um, you're doing them a favor, you're doing yourself a favor, it's a great time to get efficient. Uh, great, Matt. I think that that pretty much got to your question. Um, another thing that you talked about is uh, is over communicating, and you also mentioned things like paycheck contests, uh, things like that. I guess I'm wondering um, how much of the burden in times like these do you share with employees uh, versus how much you shoulder on your own. That's a really great question. Uh, like I said at the very tail end there, I don't really think you can fool your employees. So I think you should give up trying. Uh, they'll see it on your face. I used to come out, when we had our whole staff meetings, I would come out because my office was right next to the, the living room where we had them. I would come out and they would all look at me and they would just instantly know, like within seconds. I didn't have to say a word. Um, I, I, everyone has to make their own judgment. Uh, obviously, uh, it's a terrifying time out there. Uh, but I, I, I've never found an experience in everything I went through where it wasn't better for me to share more. Yeah, and I'll just add in my experience, I think shouldering some of that actually has the reverse effect where it can actually be inspiring for other people to to take part and, and sort of get an all hands on deck type of feel. Um, so there's a bunch of questions flowing in. I think we'll just go to audience Q and A if that's okay. Great. Um, so the first one's from Rickard Werner. Uh, I have done my fair share of payable juggling, sometimes in the ways in ways that made me feel uncomfortable. Would you agree that frank honesty followed by living up to your commitments with vendors is far better than quote stringing them along? That is, be honest about when you can pay and live up to it. Utterly. Um, I had this uh, pay uh, receivables clerk at our fruit supplier named Eleanor Keating. Uh, my wife, who's probably watching this, uh, is, I'm sure, smiling. I spent almost as much time with Eleanor on the phone in Cleveland, Ohio, as I did uh, with my family. Um, they, they lost $75,000 when that other little dairy went under. And um, I... Uh, uh, and they still somehow kept shipping me product. And uh, in the end, the way we got through this was that Eleanor and I would talk each week. We had a Tuesday standing appointment. I would call her. She would say, how's it going? We would talk about what was going on. Uh, and then I would, she would say, well, what can you send me this week? And I would tell her. And sometimes it was disappointing. And sometimes uh, I couldn't send her anything. But what was key to that relationship, which we engaged in this, for a year and a half, okay, weekly phone calls, was that I always sent what I said I was going to. Um, again, it's an extension of over-communicating. I, I think you've got to be absolutely as brutally candid as you can stand. Yeah, so that over-communication is external as, as well as internal. Definitely. Um, Brian Carr uh, said, uh, what is your suggestion on promotions? Uh, on promotions, three future periods, May, June, and July. What about back to school? We have a brand that sells mostly during holiday Q4. What do you suggest then? Well, uh, most of the companies, the boards I sit on are most of the uh, folks I'm helping. And, and by the way, uh, tomorrow's webinar is about exactly this. And we'll, I'll, we'll show a slide at the end so you'll know what I'm speaking about. But Naturally Bay Area is putting on a fantastic uh, program with 
a whole group of folks who are uh, vendors, manufacturers, bankers, uh, uh, who can uh, speak more to this. I'd, I'd recommend you get on it, this two hour session. But um, I, I don't think uh, you should freeze Q4. I think you should go ahead, stay, keep it in the, I mean, this is part of being optimistic, right? We've got to see our way out of this. And again, I'll go back to my opening point. Those of us on this call who are asking these questions, I mean, we're doing our part. This is our responsibility to help restart our economy here. So I think you've got to uh, have it in the queue. Obviously, uh, uh, communicating with uh, your, 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 your retail partners on that, but they're expecting uh, this stuff. I, I did today get the third consecutive um, uh, uh, postponement of a promotion for one of the companies I'm on the board of. Uh, it was originally postponed to May 1st, it was then postponed to July 1st, and now it's September 1st. But this is part of over-communicating, but for sure, I, I think we've got to believe Q4 and back to school are, are, are going to be, uh, are, are worth uh, holding up. So we have three questions that just came in that are all sort of along the same lines. Um, and actually, maybe I can touch on this a bit. Ali asked, for a new product that doesn't yet have retail distribution, how would you recommend connecting with buyers now? Or should we wait until things go back to normal? Uh, and then we had another one. Do you have advice for brands looking to enter the market in this time? Um, I'll, I'll just jump in that quickly and Please. just say, um, we, like Gary said, uh, we have a lot of innovation that was set to come out during the rollout during the next uh, eight to 12 months. So that's presenting to buyers right now. So far from what I've seen, nobody is accepting physical samples. So that's obviously a huge barrier. Um, there is obviously, I think, work you can do uh, on, the, on the front end, even before samples are received. Um, but generally right now, it's a really tough landscape for selling in. So for us, it's, it's really resulted in just focusing online and on Amazon, which is still a so, great go-to-market strategy anyway. Yeah, so I actually have a slightly different experience, though I think that uh, a lot of retailers would agree with Ethan. Uh, I am on the board of a little company that had, uh, like so many of you, uh, flown out, flown their samples out to Expo, uh, and uh, you know we're planning to introduce and launch right now. Uh, and I will tell you that a couple of their major customers are taking samples; uh, they're being shipped in. Obviously, it's all being done remote. I mean, by Zoom, um, they are uh, processing mainly because they have lead times where, like the previous. Uh, uh, question uh, they're looking at q4 they're looking at back to the, back to school or even next January uh, this happens to be in the perishable space uh, I will tell you that uh, <coughs> a number of infra NCG and Whole Foods uh, buyers are actually looking at product I will also tell you that some of the majors are are seeing some it's just that the, everything is just elongated now um, all right <coughs> Robbie asked, uh, views on DTC slash online right now and how the omni-channel landscape will change going forward. Great. Well, this is obviously the moment where uh, most of us are learning. Uh, if we weren't already capitalizing on direct-to-consumer, we're certainly doing that now. Um, I am uh, involved, besides Ethan, uh, with uh, companies uh, who are now getting uh, 80 to 90% of their sales direct-to-consumer where it was 30, 40, 50 before. Um, and uh, uh, ranging from a little startup called Beyond Broth, in, uh, which I'm on the board of in Boulder, which uh, has had a five or six fold increase in online sales in the last month. I mean, it's absolutely amazing to see what's going on. We're just hustling to keep up. To uh, Orgain, uh, Andrew Abraham's uh, incredible company, which I'm also on the board of Andrew, will. Uh, be leading one of these webinars shortly in the next uh, couple of days, uh, weeks. Um, Orgain's uh, direct to consumer Amazon sales have just, we've never seen anything like it. Uh, just absolutely crazy. So the great news here is it's an amazing time for trial. Uh, and uh, for the earlier questioner about launching, uh, who was asking about launching Ethan coming up, I would say find a way. Um, even if it's on your own site. I, I was talking to two uh, wonderful entrepreneurs in New Zealand yesterday, uh, two young ladies who have a beautiful line of, uh, they call themselves the Chia Sisters, a beautiful line of drinks. Uh, they were 80% selling into cafeterias in New Zealand, which are of course now closed. 
And now they're going, they've gone to 80% direct to consumer, selling 12 packs and cases. And it's a great time for the earlier point about skew rationalization to learn what really works, get a lot of, get a lot of learning, get a lot of trial. So um, I see this as the boom for us, uh, especially those of us in the organic or better for you or immune uh, boosting. And Ethan, you could certainly comment on your own experience. Yeah, well, I'll just add that we pivoted not only um, in, in terms of emphasis on strategy, but emphasis on products. And obviously that depends on, on the brand and your assortment, but all, all we did was turn and just lean into our immunity and wellness items over our more energy focused ones. So there's things you can do sort of just within your own assortment as well. Um, this is a great question and probably one a lot of people are wondering from Peter K. Uh, thoughts on fundraising at this time? Is it remotely realistic until the crisis passes? Hi, Peter. Good to hear from you. So um, Ethan knows this story. Um, very happy story. Uh, a week ago, a friend of mine uh, who owns a uh, owned and had sold his company to a large strategic uh, called to say that strategic is uh, in bankruptcy and his little company is going to be for sale. And uh, if we could pull together 5 million bucks, um, it, I, he said, I know it's crazy. This is an insane period. If we could pull together 5 million bucks, we might be able to bid and win. Well, in the last six days, a group of uh, folks uh, stepped forward, uh, came up with 5 million bucks. And last night at midnight, we won the bid. And uh, now we've taken this company, a wonderful, beautiful organic brand you'll be hearing about soon. Uh, back, uh, back, and it's now going to be run again by the original founders, founding family. Um, this is a time that investors are looking for opportunity. Uh, it's uh, go back to my don't ask, don't get. Uh, don't, don't. Uh, if you don't ask right now, shame on you. Uh, don't believe. Uh, you know, there's a lot of folks who are sitting on cash right now, and they they know that uh, fortunes are made in times like this. And again, uh, I know this may feel you know, horrible, right? That we're all talking about all this capitalism and money and raising when people are literally dying out there. But I, I, I need to take that off your shoulders. If you are not a healthcare worker, like I said at the beginning, um, then your responsibility is A, to stay home and not spread this disease and B, help drive our economy right now. Help create the jobs, the trickle down that's gonna make it possible for nurses and healthcare workers to get good quality food, to take care of themselves and for people to have jobs. Uh, my friend Danny Meyer had to let 2000 people go from his, uh, his uh, uh, restaurants in New York, but I'm on the board of Blue Apron and Blue Apron has exploded with sales and we're hiring as many of those people as we possibly can. So, you know, we've got to look to the opportunity right now, got to help people find those jobs and plenty of investors are out looking. So uh, I would not to back off from that at all. Right. Every crisis has winners and losers. Um, and, and given the segment we're in, grocery and supplements, uh, there's plenty to be excited about even in this time. Um, oh, that one just disappeared. Uh, Elizabeth asked, uh, any thoughts or opinion on virtual demos? Wow. That's a, <laughs> such a great question. Uh, I mean, I always used to joke, of course, that the key with our yogurt was that we could ship it 3,000 miles. It was the last 18 inches that make all the difference. Uh, so tasting, of course, virtually is pretty rough, but, but showing how to cook, how to use your product, uh, you know, with Grace uh, and, and Sarah's uh, Beyond Broth, uh, it's a wonderful product to cook with. I think a demo, uh, uh, Grace, I hope you're listening. I think it's a really good idea. Um, you know, people are dying to know how to use uh, their stuff. So why the heck not? I mean, we're all learning new ways of communicating, right? How many of us have been on living on Zoom? And it's a wonderful medium for this. So why the heck not? Okay, Craig asked, did you, did you overpay any of your vendors as you got more cash, given the support they gave you as you were on your journey? Never. Oh, Loyalty, sorry. I, I mean, I mean, uh, no, uh, sorry. Um, no, look, uh, you know, well, I will use the, the fruit vendor that you mentioned, I believe Stonyfield still buys from them. Yeah, right? that's, so. that's, a, that, that, that's a good, that's the right one. So, so they lost. So I'll just tell you this very quickly and, and we'll have time for one more. Uh, we got we a little more time, sorry. Um, so what Ethan's referring to is when, when 
I started to explain this. These guys lost $125,000 when that other company went under. And, that, and somehow when we reopened our factory, they still kept shipping me fruit. And then they called one day and said, what the heck's going on? Where's our 125K? I said, look, I, I have good news and bad news. Uh, can I come see you? <laughs> and they said, sure, fly out. So we, I borrowed a credit card, flew to Cleveland. And I went to them and I said, look, here's the bad news. I can't pay that 125. And here's the good news. If you keep shipping me at the rate of my current volume, I'll need another $250,000 of fruit in the next six months. I said, so here's what I'm willing to do, or here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to keep shipping me and uh, we'll roll it over into a note payable and I'll pay you back over two years, uh, which was a joke because nobody, I, I said, I'll pay you back at your whatever rate uh, you want to charge, which is a joke because nobody would lend to me at any rate. I said, um, I'll secure it with my stock, uh, which was a liability, not an asset. Uh, and I said, and we won't buy fruit from anybody else as, until we're paid you off, which was a joke because nobody would sell me. This is if you don't ask, you don't get, right? Well, to Ethan's point, they, they, they advanced us that $250,000 of fruit over the next six months. And to this day, uh, they are still our fruit supplier. And we have uh, purchased now um, close to uh, $2 billion worth of fruit over the 35 years. So uh, the payment is staying in business. I, I didn't overpay, but the payment to them is keeping in business and being loyal. And of course, uh, uh, that kind of loyalty must be and should be rewarded. Uh, okay, so we have about five minutes till the hour, but there's plenty rolling in. So I'll yeah, let let's keep going. I've got a two minute close. So let's go three more minutes. Uh, okay. Trevor, hey Trevor. Uh, Trevor asked, how have you come to understand the best way to go from idea to first step action? What elements likely have to be overcome and is the first step the biggest? Wow, I need about an hour and a half for this one, Trev. Um, I think, you know, this, if I was going to sum, sort of summarize the five pieces of advice, it really is about believing in yourself. And I think we are our own worst enemies sometimes with our self-doubt. We're also, flip side of that, to, to temper that is we're also our worst enemies with uh, taking on too much. Uh, there's nothing like focus to be successful. Uh, and after you've combed it over and beaten the hell out of yourself, uh, do I have it right, do I have it right, do I have it right, and you've run your cash flows, then you gotta pull the trigger. And uh, you know, sometimes your spouse will think you're crazy, and mine has plenty of reason to have uh, to believe that. Um, but uh, look, you got to try things for them to work. So I would say the first thing is looking in the mirror, knowing in your heart of hearts that you have um, flushed it out as best you can, and then and then going. I also want to say quickly: this is a moment uh, in terms of over communication. Make sure you have a circle of advisors around you. Uh, this is a key key time for that. Uh, check in more frequently than not. They will help you. Uh, my uh, amazing board, including my incredible mother-in-law, were uh, absolutely, uh, you know, they helped me from being my own worst enemy. I, I hope I answered that. It's an important yeah, it's question. A, yeah. Um, well, I think we should just go ahead on into the close here. There are a few other questions. So, Carlene, maybe we can uh, just record those and get back to them separately. I see them kind of rolling in steadily, but I know you want to get to the, uh, the end here. Okay. So um, is that, am I sharing now, Eth? Nope. Okay, sorry, I have to get this. Okay, here we go. Um, all right, am I up now? There you go. Okay, so look, uh, first, thank you all. I know these are scary times. You can tell by the quality of questions, we could probably do this all day. Uh, I know there's a lot of fear out there, but this is the way we deal with it. We help each other, we help ourselves. And so first I wanna mention that we do have a bunch more of these webinars and this is an extraordinary group of uh, very wise folks who many of you will know as successes, but I promise you each and every one of them have not always been successes. Like me, they had to overcome insane stuff to get there. Uh, we will begin on Thursday with my dear friend, Tommy First, uh, who was the co-founder of Nantucket Nectar. So I hope you'll stick with us for more of these. Um, I also want to remind you that we do have the um, Hirschberg Entrepreneurship Institute happening on the 7th and 8th. Um, this is a two-day boot camp. Uh, it'll be done virtually. Uh, do it right from your home. Uh, we charge $150. 
uh, which is just to cover the cost of putting this thing on, uh, that you can go see the program at hirschberginstitute.com. Um, I promise you there's useful stuff here. There's a detailed workshop on how to not run out of cash and how to manage your cash flow. Um, this is uh, all about cases. Submit your cases, and on the site you can see to do that. There will be four cases um, with people trying to raise capital and an amazing array of coaches and leaders to help you with your case. We have some fantastic speakers um, at lunch, and then we have a whole afternoon of four cases on positioning your brand uh, with some, again, incredible speakers. On the Friday, 16 of you will be able to pitch your actual you'll be able to actually raise money to over 30 active investors um, who will be online that day. Uh, Walter Robb and Corinne Schindler and, uh, and uh, Ben Nauman from uh, Infra and from NCG will also join us to talk about those two uh, uh, firms. So please uh, join with us uh, May 7th and 8th. And finally, I mentioned this a few times, uh, tomorrow, we have this free live webinar on financing your business through turbulent times while not running out of cash. Uh, incredible speakers uh, giving their time. This is a great time. Two-hour webinar that starts at uh, 3 p.m. Eastern. Um, Ethan, thank you so much for uh, joining us. Julie and Carlene, thank you for putting this on. And all of you, thank you. Uh, good luck and stay safe. Thanks.